hope it goes right Please don't try to stop me or this show like I just hit a lick, I hope it go right Please don't try to stop me or this show like Kicking down these doors, I hope it goes right I just made a play, I hope it goes right I just hit a lick, I hope it go right Please don't try to stop me or this show like His name is Charles Williamson, but for almost a decade his name was replaced by a series of numbers assigned to him by the Federal Bureau of Corrections. Those numbers served as a daily reminder that he was doing time for credit card fraud. When I say fraud, I'm not talking the typical minor league lick for a pair of Jordans. I'm talking major fraud to the tune of $20 million, but we'll elaborate on that a little later because every story has a beginning. And this story starts with another alias that Williamson went by. And that was Gorilla Black. One day, you know, I was in a real dark space. Um, and at that time, I was financially inept. So a lot of money that I had previously made and with being in the industry, with touring, with publishing, all of that had pretty much been exhausted of me living and, you know, cr trying to create a business, which was my barbershop. A lot of y'all that's been throughout the city, a lot of people know me from owning, you know, hair salons and barbershops, you know, being in the hair business over the last almost 20 years, whether it's creating products, whether it's shops and so forth. So um, an associate introduced me. And when an associate introduced me to it, I seen the power of it. And I was in a dark space at that time. I, I'll be the first to admit that. And I realized that it was a potential way to change things up for me in the immediate future on my finances. But I really didn't understand the mechanics behind it. And so once, you know, I've always been an inquisitive individual by nature. So me sitting down and really getting an understanding of exactly how it worked. Once I did. I ended up connecting with somebody and when I did connect with this person through, you know, the dark web, he had sent me a batch of, you know, cards. And I think it was like November of that year. And I think the first month I made about $50,000. And from that point out, I realized that, you know, he had codependency problems. He was, you know, pretty much a heroin addict. And, um, from that point out, our conversation became a little bit deeper. And so he understood that I had the financial ability to be able to take these cards and actually make a profit. And um, he was having financial issues of his own because of his codependency problem. So I took it upon myself to ingratiate myself to the point of where I would pay for all of the other means that came to get in the cars, whether it be, you know, the servers or whether it be, you know, all of the different technology that was needed and malware and so forth of that nature. And I pretty much funded it. And so <clears throat> once I got to that level, I realized that I got really, really, really deep and um, to where, you know, it was it was nothing to harvest you know, in a week's time, two to 3,000 cards. And um, I had the understanding and the sophisticated means to be able to tap into thousands of pods pretty much worldwide. And um, I would take those cards as I would get them and let them sit in different batches and so forth. So my level of understanding of how the complexity of it, it was it was complex at first, but uh, that that, complexity just pretty much grew into child's play after a while because he explained to me on so many different levels and as that happened I pretty much graduated into you know other circumstances with other individuals who was doing the same thing so that just expounded itself into a whole nother you know situation and where it just continued to 
you know, grow and um, yeah. You mentioned the dark web, mm -hmm. um, and that's always been like a mythical thing to me. Like, how, how did you learn that technology? Did they teach you all the technology on how to get access to dark web and everything like that? Well, it was pretty much a lot of different sites in which <clears throat> me doing my homework, delving and delving and delving and delving. And in that era, there was websites that actually sold and marketed, you know, um, their capabilities of, you know, selling dumps, which is quote unquote credit card numbers. Um, I went on one site and, you know, there was a messaging um, technology that was pretty much a, a Russian technology and in which where you could message the, you know, all of the different hackers and so forth. And so when I messaged him, how I met the individual, when I messaged him, he hit me back. And so he was like, I said, well, I need 50 cards. And so he sent them to me and I hadn't even sent them the money. And I must have made maybe about six, seven thousand dollars off of them. And um, he said, yeah, brother, woo, 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 you owe me um this. And I was like, OK, cool. So I sent him the money. And um, from there, he would just send him, just send him, send him, send him, send him, send him. And so when he got to the point to where he couldn't actually pay for, you know, the server space to be able to run the equipment and all of the gear to be able to, you know, plan all of the malware throughout all of the deposits that, you know, was pretty much worldwide. I just pretty much took over all of that aspect of it on the billing end of it. And then from there, he was able to pretty much access, you know, my computer, you know, remotely. And then step by step, I was able to learn everything exactly what he was doing. And um, it was crazy because when you look at it, it's like, if me and you standing on a block, but imagine having a big, huge ring full of keys and each one, well, not a huge ring. Let's just say we got at least five keys, mm -hmm. but we go to each back door and we try each key. And then every time it would crack on my screen it would say vulnerable. And then it's like us going to all of them. And so imagine doing that times a hundred thousand and then times a million imagine going to a million back doors trying those keys and so yeah i knew the vulnerabilities inside of microsoft's system and so once i understood that and then from there he would sit there and explain to me how to actually use you know all of the different technology and the malware that be added to it and um pretty much it was a it was a a game changer for me because I was it was it was lights out because every time you would go inside of a store a lot of you don't even realize it but you take your card and imagine you going in there and you just paying for some milk and some cookies or whatever it may be well when you slide that magnetic strip that magnetic strip sends out a series of codes which is a track one a track two and that information goes to a processor. Well, I would get inside of that line and when that information would go to the processor, it would also go to me. It go to the processor and it go to me and imagine all of the people that walk in the store in a day. So you pretty much had, um, you pretty much had access to the terminals that were in the stores. Yeah, it's a pause, a point of sales. Wow, so let me ask you this. You mentioned that you made money off of these cards. How, how would a person make money off of a credit card? Pretty much, you know, we use a machine and then I would take that machine and you could actually encode any magnetic strip with a code of numbers, which is a series of numbers which identifies every individual. So let's just say the first track would have your name on it, your last name, your first name with a series of numbers, and then there would be another one. And that would be the bin. And at the beginning numbers is the bank identification number. And then a series of numbers that would actually lead to that account. So I would just use track two, track two on everything. I made it a lot easier. I didn't need all of that. And I would just go into a store, 7-Eleven, and I would take 30 gift cards. 
that was on the shelf that had never been opened or never been touched. And I just put them in a grocery bag and walk out the store with them or anywhere I would see them. And then when I would get back to my lab, I would just open them up and with a program placed on a laptop, it would be plugged into a box. And whenever I would swipe it, it'd go bloop, bloop, bloop. And all of that information, track one, track two, well, I was usually only using track two. It would be on that card. And from there, I would give that card to my crew of individuals and they would pretty much go on shopping sprees all day. So you guys would go on shopping sprees and pretty much resell <clears throat> the items that you procured during those visits? Not really the item so much. It would just be on a shopping spree for gift cards. So, you know, I would never send a broad up in there with some booty shorts into, you know, Bloomingdale. Actually, you had to dress the part. So I would make sure that she had her hair nice and that she looked like she was someone who had a $5,000 credit card or had access to a five or $10,000 credit card. And so much, pretty much essentially, once she would just slide that card, it would ring up the sale and then she would buy items to disguise the bigger play. The bigger play was the actual gift card. So being able to get a $500 Bloomingdale card, which would pretty much retail on the streets for about $300 or 250 or whatever, 60% or half of it. So imagine she got three $500 Home Depot cards, um, a few hundred dollar Bloomingdale and Nordstrom, uh, uh, Nordstrom's cards, um, walk inside of Walmart and pretty much you could buy these cards when you buy another product. So at that time, I would let them keep all of the merchandise. All I wanted was a third, a third, a third, a third for me, a third for you, a third for the actual game, pretty much the cost of everything. So it was a third, a third, a third a split. And so you exact pretty much essentially they would keep two thirds and I would keep two thirds. Okay, now at, at your peak, how much <clears throat> money would you say this operation was grossing for you a month? Uh, it varies. I mean, because I was sending cards with females, you know, the federal government, all of this is documented. And also I was selling cards to other individuals you know, I was selling 54,000, so probably about 100,000, maybe 100, if shorter, maybe any up or anywhere around like 85, 90, somewhere around there. Oh, wow, man. So you really had an elaborate, you really had an elaborate system going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, you know, you have this going on. Uh, what was your run? Like, how many years was you doing it successfully? It wasn't a very, very long run, man. I mean, it was probably about a good two, three year run. And, um, you know, it wasn't a real, real long run because, you know, I guess the element of surprise is the surprise itself. So the individual, what brought the run pretty much to an end is the individual. I never forget. There was a, there was two locations in the Seattle area and one of the locations, you know, I never forget this because it's so eerie and I never forget getting a phone call from him. He said, I got two more spots. And so he had access to it. And when I went inside everything and I looked, I said, where did these cards come from? And when I'm, you know, taking the numbers and I'm looking by this time, I'm able to look at the first three digits of it. And so I know what's the, the bank, what banks they are. And I'm like, these are not regular cards. These are, business and corporate cards pretty much essentially and so i'm running them boom 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 boom, boom, boom. i'm running i walk in the, in a walmart in i think montclair claremont california and i walked in and i must have bought like four or five playstations and then i must have bought about another three or four five hundred dollar gift cards myself literally and i'm like damn so the cards was <laughs> they was going 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 and um to come to find out that the company that they came from had went and got a computer uh, forensic expert that was able to trace back where the card, where we planted the line and trace it all the way back to the actual server and trace it all the way back to his IP. And pretty much once that happened, yeah, it was, it was pretty much everything was on a, on a, 
on the time clock pretty much. And once they gathered, they, they gathered enough information and they grabbed him, he, you know, pretty much relinquished, you know, everything and pretty much essentially told on me. So, yeah. Oh, so, so, so he um, involved you into his mess. He got caught and pretty much rolled over on you. Yeah, pretty and, uh, much. When did you get an idea? Because I think people normally get an idea they can feel the heat on them. Right. Did you feel the heat in that instance? I didn't really know. I'll never forget at the time, um, you know, me and, you know, my son's mother, we was in Puerto Rico. And I never forget, I went out there for my birthday and I stayed at the Continental Hotel. And, you know, during my birthday is this elaborate thing that they do there where people jump in the ocean backwards and they make all of these new resolutions of how the rest of the year is going to be. And, you know, all of these different epiphanies they begin to have. And it's a holiday almost essentially there. And so we came back and whenever we came back, I owned a motorcycle shop at the present time. And I went to the motorcycle shop. And when I went to the motorcycle shop, my partner, who was my partner inside of my motorcycle shop, he was like, yo, get the fuck out of here. Federal agents been all over the place. Hawthorne, the sheriff department, Torrance Police Department, uh, the marshals, uh, the Secret Service. They had tore the shop to smithereens and um, they was looking for me. And um, yeah, I had a and then so I had a friend, you know, my friend Gio, he called, you know, an officer that he knew. And he said, man, they got a 22 count indictment. Uh, for Gorilla Black out of uh, Seattle, and that's how I found out I had a 22 count indictment. Yeah. Did you ever think about running? <sighs> Man, I wanted to run. You know, I stayed here and I had to throw my phones away. I threw everything away and try to get off of the grid. But pretty much, it's the feds, man. So everyone that was associated with me, that was interlinked with me they had under surveillance. So, you know, imagine I had this motorcycle shop, another motorcycle shop, two uh, barbershops, and also an office that, you know, at the time my wife and I was running. So I had all of the, I had five different businesses going on, plus my illicit business, my my real cash cow, my credit card hustle. So, um, yeah, I mean, I thought about running. That was a thought in my mind for a long time. But I was like, damn, where am I going to run to? Like, this is the federal government unless I'm finna leave the country and, you know, leave my kids, leave everything that I pretty much know. So the thought came across my mind. So the thought came about your mind. So when, how did the police finally, how, how did law enforcement officials finally catch up with you? I had got an attorney and, um, I was talking to the attorney, but I didn't understand that they pretty much essentially already knew where I was at. So the attorney was pretty much keeping them at bay. Um, eventually I would end up getting a paid attorney and working with a whole nother individual. Um, but I never forget it. I, um, I was sitting in there in the living room and I was reading the Bible. It's so coincidental. And we hear a knock on the door and my wife, she go answer the door. And at this time I was living in Palos Verdes. And so I hear the door, boom, 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 boom. And so she like, black, 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 black. And I'm like, what the hell, you, what's going on? And so I walk up and then, you know, the federal agents, they was all in plain clothes. They was all, you know, I'm so-and-so from the secret service. I'm so-and-so from the secret service. I'm from the secret service. I'm from the secret service. Charles Williamson, can you please step forward? I said, yeah, are you Charles Williamson? And in their hand, they had the indictment and the warrant as well. And um, they didn't even put no cuffs on me. I looked in front of my yard and I seen 600 Benzes and I seen Range Rovers and all of them was filled with federal agents. All of them was Secret Service. They literally walked me to the back of a 600 open the back door and put me in it. And along the way back to the federal building, you could see those cars swarming around. And when we got there, then they took me up there. And 
I never forget. They was like, you want to sit down and talk? I was like, man, it's been a rough day, man. I just need two things, man. I need a soft bunk, man, and a puppy meat sandwich. And we ain't got nothing else to really say. Okay. And so from there, processed me out, went to the arraignment. Following day, they sent me up to MDC. And then the Ninth Circuit, which is from Seattle up there, they sent down the request to have me uh, extradited back up to Seattle. What's so crazy and ironic, like I said previously, the places in which where we got the information from out of these two spots in Seattle and the forensic scientists, all of the information that they got, they pretty much sent it over to the federal government. And the moment that cards was moved over an international wire or over over, you know, these Internet communications, it became a federal crime. So I couldn't be prosecuted on a state level. It became all federal at that time. So it became all feds. And, and, and if I'm not mistaken, in the feds, you do 100% of that time. No, it's not 100%. You do 87.5% of it. So, um, yeah, it's 87.5%, you know, even on a nonviolent such as mine. Um, crazy part about it is, is for me to get the time that I got, I pretty much, you know, to keep a lot of other people that was involved with me out of the way, I had to give away my appeal rights as long as they allowed my family members you know, to not be caught up in, you know, my present charges on a conspiracy. So pretty much I gave away my appeal rights. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that was the honorable thing to do. Um, you know, now, when did your sentencing come about? Um, I was sentenced, actually, once they took me into custody. What was so crazy is, what is the day, the 18th? Mm -hmm. Two days ago, yeah would be the anniversary of that day is January 16th. They took me into federal custody and I probably, I got sentenced later that year of 2013, October 10th. I got sentenced October 10th. Um, I was extradited from MDC to SeaTac, SeaTac, which is Seattle, Tacoma, Washington, to have a federal holding that's there. So once that happened, um, I never forget, I think his name was Judge Gonzalez. And um, they pretty much that whole day, man, I was hearing dudes getting 60 months, 70 months, 80 months. I was like, oh, I'm going to get love. I'm going to get love. And um, I never forget. I wasn't pleading. I didn't want to plea to the 20 million dollars in fraud. That was, you know, us being slick on some on some some nickel slick shit. We not finna plead to the 20 million. It sounds a lot better pleading to 30,000 credit cards instead of pleading to. 20 million dollars a fraud so my attorney got up there with the nickel slick shit and was like you know we pleading the you know these 30,000 credit cards the judge was like man i ain't trying to hear that man this is a 20 million dollar fraud case and just swatted my attorney like pow and you know during this with me signing for open plea my life is literally in the judge's hand it's not like a regular where I'm locked into a set amount of time. I have my guidelines, which is 108 to 135 months. So the judge can give me within that range or he could go above it during, you know, behind the mitigating circumstances under one bank fraud charge, which I pled to over five of them. Bank fraud carries a maximum penalty of 30 years. I pled to aggravated identity theft. Aggravated identity theft carries a 24 mandatory sentence. I pled it also to access device fraud, which is essentially any device that you're able to use as a communication vehicle for bank information as well. So I never forget it, man. He was like, um, you know what, Mr. Williams? So today I can give you 20 years. And uh, man, I mean, I just felt like my whole life flashed and I'm literally sitting here in a black box cuffed. He said, but I'm not going to do that to you. He said, I'm going to give you for these charges right here. That's going to be 87 months. And on top of that, I'm going to give you another 24 months for the aggravated identity theft. So that's going to be 110 months. But he said, you ever come back up in this courtroom again, I will give you 20 years. Uh, oh. And so... <laughs> Where did you do your time at? I did most of my time, man, at uh, Lompoc Federal Correctional uh, Institution up there in Lompoc, California. So, 
Yeah, and FCC you, Long Pond. And you That's was, in Santa Maria, California, actually. And you were locked in with some interesting people. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, the first place where they housed me at was in J Dorm. And J Dorm, we call that Long Pond Hills because when you come into the actual yard, there's two big buildings that's next door to each other and they've been there forever in a day and back then in the gap it used to be like they said a military you know site or whatever but we called it the projects because it was the first floor second floor third floor and on the other side it was medical then it was two more floors and so we called it the projects and inside was where they had the phone booths at and so this first dorm right here when you passed the gym was k-dorm and then when you passed the other gate past the barbershop all the way to the back that was J Dorm, and then back there, you know, I was in there with, you know, a lot of interesting characters, but more than, you know, the one that was the most essential and important, man, and I got a lot of understanding and a lot of mentoring from was Harry L, man. Uh, I think he was a, a key point for me because I had never ran into an individual who was as intelligent and a person that had this bevy of knowledge on so many different topics and situations and who was well read and could communicate itself in a way that was well articulated and intelligent. That was something that was unseen in there because everybody else was on niggerish shit. So, you know, everybody was just playing the phone, trying to get a bitch to send some bread or do this or go do that. And I never forget. He was the first individual to introduce me to Aggie Mandino. Uh, that book, man, is by African Arthur and introduced me to the everything store store, uh, a book about Jeff Bezos. Just he had four lockers full of nothing but books. The man would just have books after books after books after books. And he would order books. And then he would bring them over there and say, hey, baby boy, read this. And then come back and be like, man, let me know what's up with that book. And I'll be giving him a summation of pretty much how the book broke down. And he already knew that I was a fast reader. But, you know, the most protective books was these books that he had from this African author named Agi Mandino. So, oh, you already know what I'm talking about, and I done researched it, and I done got two of his books. But Aggie Mandino was a dope, 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 uh, dope writer, and um, he wrote things in these parables. So that's what made it so dope with this African Arthur, and he was real, real protective. And I never forget, Unc pulled up on me, he was like, "Baby boy, you finished with that book?" And I, and all of the years, almost seven years, I never seen him that protective about books and the book ain't nothing about this thing but those was books i think that he had begun reading at the beginning of his bid and you know he walked down life in the state that's 25 and he was in the fed serving another 19 years so you know um that was those books was definitely incredible and um he just introduced me to so many different authors man just authors that i have never heard of or never you know begin you know to even think that was super duper dope like a lot of people don't even, you know, read a lot of the different books that Robert Kiyosaki wrote. But one of the dopest books that he wrote was Retire Young, Retire Rich. I mean, just so many different authors that I was able to read, um, you know, how to win, pe win people and influence people by Dale Carnegie. Just all kind of different authors that I read up on and just read their books. And um, he introduced me to a lot of them books. Yeah, you know. A lot of our people, a lot of the viewers out there have never been to prison before. Give us a brief summary of prison life in general. I mean, prison is a place based on respect. Everything is dealt from a place of respect. Everything is dealt on a place of being on man time. And you being a man first before any and all things, you know, I don't care what kind of squabbles you got. I don't care what kind of killer you is. If you go in there looking for something, they're going to give you what you're looking for. Whatever it is, whatever level you think, when you go in there on a respectable level, on some man time, you know, and whatever adversity come your way, you handle it immediately. And a lot of times that's, you know, through, you know, whether it's we get down, going run one, or if it needs even be to go to another level where we got to go get that knife, you know, however it need to be dealt with, it's finna get dealt with and it's finna get dealt with quickly and fast. Another thing with prison, 
especially being around a lot of the individuals is you got to go. You got to get a homies that paperwork because these are the people that you're going to be living with essentially sometimes a decade, sometimes multiple decades. And a dude just want to know that you solid. You know, he don't, you know, you sitting here eating soups and snacks and fun packs and you fucked up. That's that's the ultimate disrespect. If you fucked up, you fucked up. Understand that. Understand that. This ain't the place for you to be. And, and when you moving in there, everything is going to be on respect time. You're not finna. What's so crazy is. Once you see that violence jump off, everybody's super respectful because they understand that that violence could take place in the in in the inkling of a second. And that violence could mean your life. It could mean your ass whoops severely just in an inkling. And in there is just every day. It's the monotony of doing the same thing over and over and over and over and it's repetitive and it's you become programmable and you're on a program. So at this time, you wake up at 430 in the morning at six o'clock. You hear the yard call. You do the same thing day in, day out. You become desensitized to, you know, you guys, it's a big hoorah for the holidays. But when you away from loved ones, family members and you in a place where it's grim and it's, it's dark, you become desensitized to it and, the only way you able to get any information or understand what's going on in the real world is through any literature that comes through, whether it be a newspaper, whether it be magazines or what you see through the bubble. And you living through a bubble pretty much and watching the television. That's the only way you know what's going on in the real world out there and through phone calls and emails. So that's how prison is. It's just on a respect level like. If someone's going to the shower and it's a line of clothes, you can't just walk and just go in to the shower and just take a shower at leisure. No, it's people before you and that I get you caught up in wreck immediately. You can't put your hands on somebody outside of your race that will get your ass disciplined immediately. You can't eat from somebody else. You can't. I don't care how bomb a tacos. They look like they over there making you better not take your ass over there and get none. And that's just how prison is. You know, where you watch TV, you watch TV where our TVs is at. You know, a lot of dudes are like, oh, man, I'm going to do what I'm. No, 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 no. Ain't no man bigger than the program. Ain't nobody bigger than the car. No matter how big you is, you become this small when you walk into prison. Because all you got is your people. And that's it. And you're going to do what they say, when they say it, and how it's done. And you pretty much, you know. You won't you you ain't on your time. You you on the car's time and how it's going to move is how you going to move. Now, when did you get the news? Um, I want to go back to the exact day and the time and how you feel the array of emotions that were running through your body when you found out she was getting out of prison. Oh, wow. I mean, I had waited for so long and they finally gave me a date. And I want to say it was like April 11th. And. What it is, is you're waiting for the halfway house to give you a date. So that was an emotional thing in itself. And so imagine that rush of emotion. And then when COVID came, it pushed that date again to May 18th. May 18th is when of 2020 is when I walked out of a federal facility. And I never forget that morning between my bunk because at that time we didn't have access to the yard because of the COVID situation and how rampant it was. And I had just did a thousand pushups right there between the bunks. And I jumped in the shower as I usually do around that time. And I never forget. I heard the officer come up outside of the booth. Williamson, six, three, one, seven, four, one, one, two. Williamson, roll that shit up. And I said, roll it up. And so, Homies just converged on me and everything was pretty much dispensed out. You know, all your belongings pretty much is, you know, spoken for all your comrades and friends. You know, the homie get these shoes. He get these books, these headphones go over there to him. 
all of these soups go to homie over there. Everything pretty much is already spoken for before you go. So everything was spoken for and everybody converged and, you know, hugs and, you know, smiles, you know. And that moment, your stomach just bubbling and rumbling like, damn, I'm finna go home, my nigga. Finally, like, I'll never forget that feeling, like, just the excitement, the rush, just like, damn. And you be scared at the same time, though, too, like, you know, like, damn, what the fuck? Like, because you've become, I don't like to say it like this, but it's like, a low key home. So you used to this environment. You used to doing things this way. You used to I know the showers is you I got the showers, I got this bunk. I it's it's kinda it's a taboo to people who never been there, but for somebody who been there, you know you become accustomed to it. and so that fear comes in even though the excitement is the first rush, but then it's like a excitement slash fear emotion like oh shit oh shit damn damn but the excitement is still there like damn what i'm gonna eat what i'm gonna do i'm gonna get some pussy i want to drink some have me a drink you know so i it was just a whole ball of emotions man a whole ball of them like like man it's like getting a brand new car you know <laughs> yeah who, who, who picked you up from prison actually i didn't get picked up from prison um what happens is is that uh i ended up catching they gave me a bus they give you a 200 dollars. they gave me a 200 dollar card and they give you 200 dollars. and then on top of the 200 dollars, i had got all the money that was on my books from you know mm. my activities in there but all of it is put on a card and so pretty much they give you a uh a bus um ticket so the van puts you in the van and then they drive you to the bus station so when i got to the bus station i never forget i must have walked damn near 15 literally i walked like 15 blocks and i never forget i walked right into a cvs and i bought you know at that time i had never you know it's different now i've been out for a while but i seen a phone and it was in the pack and i'm like it's twenty dollars, but I got bought the phone. Boom, boom, walk all the way back to the bus station because my bus didn't come until later. And that bus would take you to the downtown Greyhound station. So, I, you know, I'm so out of the loop. You just imagine being gone for nine years. I don't know how to operate none of this shit. When I when I left, it was still buttons on phones and shit. It wasn't no Facebook, wasn't no Instagram really. Facebook had just really started pretty much. So, um. The dude took my phone, he was from the camp, and he just boom, programmed it, put the card on there, and I was able to make a phone call to Hot, and uh, Hot had me this extra bomb Uber to come pick me up, like a limo Uber and all that shit, food and all kind of stuff up in there for me. So my brother was the first one to ingratiate, make sure you know I was straight. Best, best bomb, man. Let me ask you this. What did you eat when you first got out? What did I eat? Damn. It seemed like, what did I eat? What was the first thing that I ate? I, wait a minute, what did I eat? He sent me some food. I had some food he sent in the Uber. It was like a breakfast or something like that, a bomb ass breakfast. And so I ate that on the way to the halfway house because I only had 24 hours to get to the halfway house. So that night I was just so enthralled with the phone. I just stayed at the bus station. And so when he sent the Uber, deluxe or whatever it was it suv dude with the little like a little limo or whatever not so i think it was like a breakfast in there and i ate all of that shit and that was the first uh street food i had ate because i didn't eat anything at the bus station or at the other bus station so it was like a like a breakfast thing or whatever not now before we end man i'm gonna ask you a very important question i want you to think about a little bit mm -hmm. what did prison cost you wow you know, my crime was worth $20 million, $20 million, $20 million. That's what the government charged me. My actual loss was far less. 
But the price that was even greater than the 20 million, when you take a look at it on a deeper level and scale. So I took 30,000 credit cards. So these 30,000 credit cards belong to 30,000 people at one point or another that went somewhere and probably tried to swipe that card whether it was a soccer mom pulling up to McDonald's with her kids, just trying to get something to eat for her kids going after school and try to swipe that card in. It declined. That's one of the 30,000 people. My children were left without leadership, without a father, without guidance my mother was left without her son my brothers were left without counsel my wife was left without a spouse and a provider and a love and me i was inside of a federal correctional facility i once read a thing said that rich people measure riches in materialism but the wealthy measure wealth in time. So when you understand time is the most valuable commodity that one could have, that every Fortune 500 company is trying to commoditize, then information, then leverage, and then part of leverage would be money. I gave away, I traded nine years, two months, for $20 million in fraud. The people, the places, the connections, the relationships that I could have created and made, the time with my children, the, all of that was lost. My grandmother used to say that when we die, we die with our memories. We don't take nothing else from this earth. We take with us our memories. Imagine there was no winner. Everybody lost. My children lost. My wife lost. The 30,000 people who owned those cards lost. My brothers lost. And most of all, I was lost. It was much, much. The time I gave away was the most valuable thing that one could have. I can't go back and get back. Nine years, two months of my life. You got to realize, even though our life seemed like it's long, man, this shit's short. I done lost so many people to natural causes or violent deaths while I was in and all the way to now. You can't get back time. You can always get money. Like we were just previously saying, shit, poor is temporary but I mean being broke is temporary but poor is eternal forever I can easily go get some money but I can't go get back that time I can't 